Well, welcome everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are. It could be in the middle of the night if you're on the on the uh, Pacific coast, but uh, it's pretty. It's getting pretty late, almost cocktail hours in Europe. And for us, it's normal time for a conference, except that there's no uh, real bad coffee to drink. We have to uh, make our own or buy our own. Uh, each speaker should uh, uh, unmute un himself or herself when they, they want, right? I mean, I'm not going to be in control of this. Um, you have five to seven minutes to make your initial comments, but you'll have plenty of time to clarify or add. Uh, I will remind you of your time if you can't do it yourself. I wish you could, because we can do the tech, low tech, this, or I can ask her to mute you if you're really obnoxious. Uh, five to seven minutes. Is that is that okay for everyone? I think you can uh, you can probably do it in five to seven minutes. Uh, the audience of the participant, there's quite a few of them, about 50, uh, may ask question on the chat. And I would suggest that you look at the chat because some might be directed directly to you, right? Uh, you can see two and then it's to you. So you may want to uh, raise your hand <laughs> and say, I want to answer that one. Um, well, finally, uh, I sent you all a message about how um, it's not very clear to everyone what uh, controlled digital lending is. And I'm certainly not a lawyer or a librarian. Uh, I'm basically a user of libraries, so that's my point of view. I understand in simple terms that uh, control uh, digital lending is basically uh, the equivalent of traditional lending by a library, except that the book is scanned and one book, one scan, one reader. That's what I think most consumer, most people understand is, is done. We also understand that they are technology protection measure. That's why it comes with the control idea. And uh, I don't know if anybody has experienced that, but I have after two weeks, if you a slow reader, phew, it disappears. So that's the technology protection measure in all its beauty, I guess. You cannot download the book, you cannot make copies, you cannot send it, and there's digital rights management. So nobody can really sell, uh, steal it. Um, I think that uh, a good uh, controlled digital lending practice can really allow libraries, especially during a pandemic, to do a better job that they can with their door closed. Um, now, I understand also that it's uh, it's used in the U.S. It's widely used in the U.S. Actually, I mean, if you look at the number of places where you can uh, get access to uh, controlled digital lending, but it's not well known everywhere. And uh, while it's it's recognized as uh, permitted by law by copyright law in the U.S., it's being challenged right now. A lot of people know that, and a lot of people could address that better than me, of course. But we're here uh, to actually get more informed about the practices, the right practices, the consequences, and uh, also to observe uh, or examine what, what's going on in other parts of the world. Because the pandemic, as you know, is a global pandemic and we're all in the same boat. Um, so there's, there's a three-step test and there's the, uh, the, the, the exception, there's, that's one system. You have the fair use system and um, the first sale doctrine in some jurisdictions. I mean, there's really a lot of different ways to, to get to a, a CDL system. So some of the questions and issues that uh, are interested, interesting to me, and I, I'm counting on, on you all experts to, uh, to clarify these things, is to, what is it really we're talking about? What are the principles of CDL? And uh, what do they mean by control? Um, what are the library able to do really in your jurisdiction or in your world? Because you could be in an institution or a nonprofit or a student or a librarian, it's all different. Um, is it a solution in the digital era when there's a market failure with the licensing or when licensing is too expensive? Um, when, when does the public interest weigh as much as the right uh, of, uh, of authors? Um, and what does the case law in the USA in, that, in, in the public interest weighing in or not? Um, a question that's very personal to me is the impact of CDL or lack of CDL for people with low vision. 
Uh, I, I'm myself not very, very good at reading books, so I have to use technology. Um, what is, in your, in your world, what is the appropriate answer to, uh, to CDL during the pandemic? And um, what should be available via CDL? And finally, if you were to draft legislation, and I think it's a good exercise to think about, what would you say? What would you make it? Um, and finally, for some people, what, what do you think the, the future of libraries are when um, everything is, is getting to be different? So uh, I'm gonna leave you at that. I will interrupt you if you pass your seven minutes. Uh, unlike some people that you know, <laughs> I don't like to interrupt, so I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm not very good at it. So I, I really hope you stick to your, uh, your minutes and uh, that I don't have to uh, be rude. Um, now, we'll start with Dave Hansen, and, and I, I hope you can just introduce or, or talk about your affiliation so people understand better. Thank you. Sure. <clears throat> thank you. And uh, thank you to KEI for um, organizing this call. Uh, so I better time myself here so I don't get interrupted. Um, uh, so I'm Dave Hansen. Uh, I am a librarian. Um, and a uh, lawyer focuses on copyright law at uh, Duke University. So um, I, I'm our lead copyright information policy uh, uh, person there. Um, and I'm also uh, the person who's responsible for our library's uh, overall collection strategy and research support for the um, researchers and the students at our, our university. Um, and like a lot of research libraries, you know, we take a pretty broad view of the community that we serve. Um, we collect books uh, and we serve out books for people who are Duke students and faculty, but we also send books out all around the world, um, you know, to, to, to meet broader research needs. We understand that we are part of a much bigger uh, network of institutions that are trying to um, promote uh, advancements in science and advancements in learning. Um, and so that's where I wanted to start. Uh, so. Um, uh, I am I'm a co-author of the white paper that uh, has gotten a lot of traction uh, for um, articulating the legal case for uh, controlled digital lending in the United States based on the fair use doctrine that we have um, under US law, which gives us quite a bit of flexibility um, to address new technological uses and to allow the law to adapt to, uh, to, to changing environments. Um, and I can talk a bit about the law, but I wanted to start off with just the policy of what libraries are trying to do here um, and the problem that we face. Uh, so at Duke, I, I'm just going to use Duke because I know it really well, but this is not kind of statements that are unique to our library. Um, we have uh, approximately 7 million volumes of print materials in our collection. Um, and uh, those 7 million volumes are. Um, circulated a great deal amongst the users who can get onto our campus. Um, but uh, Duke has a problem and lots of libraries have this problem of we are in a particular place that makes it difficult for lots of people to get into those materials for a variety of reasons. We have students, we have other researchers who you know, have um, accessibility limitations that make it difficult for them to get into those books. Um, we have uh, students who have grown up in a learning environment and in a research environment for whom, you know, using print materials is just an entirely foreign concept to them. Um, we have researchers who are spread around the world um, and uh, even mailing them books, uh, which we, we uh, do on occasion. Um, but even doing things like that uh, is really difficult, you know, if you're trying to access a particular resource in a timely manner when you're doing research out, you know, on the, uh, in the outer banks of North Carolina, not even that far away, but even that can be difficult to get physical materials to them. Um, and then, you know, the other thing is our university exists not just for those people who are paying tuition or who are, you know, getting a salary as faculty. Like I said, we aim to, to benefit the broader world by putting knowledge in the service of society. And that means making our materials broadly available to a wide number of people who don't necessarily have the uh, economic wherewithal to show up on campus. Um, in, in the last year, we have an additional factor that's been added in, which is for a lot of people, uh, particularly people who um, are older or who have health complications, it's super risky for them to just show up. Um, and we don't want them showing up on campus. We want them to stay away because we want to protect their health. Um, 
And, and so we have these physical materials that, you know, they, they serve a purpose, but they have lots of limitations. And this is where we're bumping up against as a library, uh, kind of our fundamental mission, which I think matches up really closely with, at least in the US, the articulation of what US copyright law is designed to do. It's designed to promote the progress of science and the useful arts, right? And, and as a library, um, our goal is to provide these kind of raw materials for researchers to engage with, to advance their thinking, to advance their learning. Um, and yet we have this big barrier in front of us. Um, now for lots of materials, we are able to obtain electronic versions of that content, which greatly lowers those barriers. You know, we buy, uh, we have purchased millions of eBooks. Uh, we, we license access to tons, like the vast majority of our collections budget goes towards licensing electronic content. But that doesn't solve the problem of all of the content that we've bought over the years that is just not available um, in electronic formats. Uh, you know, you sometimes hear this phrase, the 20th century black hole. Um, and that's a real concept and that's a real problem for us where we just can't buy ebooks of, you know, a book that was published originally in 1960 that had a single print run. And, you know, today it's very difficult to even track down who the rights holders might be. Um, we've done work to try to do that. In a lot of instances, you just hit, hit dead ends. Um, so that's the, the policy problem. Um, uh, the, the thing that we are trying to do as libraries with controlled digital lending is do the thing that we've done all along, do the thing that libraries have done um, before there even was a copyright act, before the statute of and cop libraries were lending materials. Um, we were getting materials into the hands of users in a way that was useful in a relevant way to them. And that's what we're trying to do with controlled digital lending today is take that same kind of lending practice, uh, that same sort of market dynamic that has been built into the Copyright Act for ages, um, and activate that in the digital environment. And so, you know, I actually view controlled digital lending as um, a pretty bad way of getting materials into people's hands because it has so many limitations. Um, as a library that is spending tons of money on research content, I would much rather redirect those dollars towards truly open access content. And that's what we're, we're slowly doing um, for, you know, current acquisitions where we don't want to buy paywalled access. We want to pay to to get rid of the paywall um, so that multiple people can access content at the same time. And, and that's, that's the market that, that I think is for the future. Um, but looking backwards with all of this rights thicket that we're trying to kind of deal with, um, uh, controlled digital lending is a limited way of preserving that market balance by saying, okay, we're gonna lend on the same terms that we had lent in the past, um, physical materials and, and create a, a um, an equivalent um, digital environment to accomplish that same sort of market dynamic uh, in the digital realm. And what that means is, and I know I've got 13 seconds left here, is, um, <laughs> uh, is we put a lot of controls around it. That's the whole idea of implementing um, a DRM system uh, to prevent you know, files from leaking out and, and harming the market. Uh, particularly, uh, but that's also the idea with, um, you know, having uh, lend limits, not allowing for materials to linger out there for very long, um, and, uh, you know, otherwise approximating that physical lending environment. So I didn't talk about the law because there are other people who can get into, I think, uh, some of the details on that, but um, that's the, the policy perspective from where libraries are coming from on this. Thank you. <laughs> ready to hand it off to whoever's next. Thank you, that, that was uh, very informative. I think Meredith is, is next. Yeah, um, so my name is Meredith Rose. Um, I know a lot of you, but for those of you who don't know me, I'm Senior Policy Counsel of Public Knowledge. Uh, I manage our copyright portfolio. Um, and controlled digital lending is something that we have been working on for uh, quite some time now. Uh, and one of the perspectives that we bring is from the sort of broader national policy perspective. So, you know, coming from, um, as somebody who fundamentally spends a lot of time on Capitol Hill, uh, you, you know, we have been asking for ages, uh, we have been asking libraries to continuously sort of expand their mandate for ages. Um, you know, all of a sudden you have situations now where, where libraries have become, in a lot of cases, the only point of access for broadband, uh, for example. You know, they become these real pillars of the community. Um, but the one thing that has always stayed the same, as Dave mentioned earlier, is that the core mandate of libraries has always been the same, which is to buy books, lend books out, for free to their users and preserve books. 
Um, and CDL is really a way of doing that um, that still preserves uh, the market for printed works. Um, so there's enormous benefits for CDL uh, to various sort of underserved populations. Um, we've seen a lot of interest in how this helps um, disabled readers, how this helps um, readers who are mobility challenged, who for whatever reason cannot get to a physical library but live within its service area. Um, very rural populations, uh, members of the military who were forward deployed overseas uh, and cannot access ebooks um, or the same kinds of library materials that they would like to access. Um, small communities uh, who want to preserve local history or niche texts. Uh, delicate texts that cannot be circulated. And from an econ perspective, just going to put on my hat here, um, a lot of this is in response to a market failure. Uh, these are works, overwhelmingly, these are works uh, if, for which there is no universe in which there is ever going to be a native ebook. There is never, ever going to be a native ebook of the, you know, the history of Grand County, Utah. Uh, there is never going to be a native ebook for um, a lot of works written in, um, you know, the, the specific written languages of indigenous communities, um, oral histories, written histories, um, the, uh, you know, a lot of collections within university libraries, which are very deep and very specific um, and have been printed, you know, decades ago, there is no ebook market to compete with in these cases. Um, and CDL is structured in such a way that they are limiting the number of copies in circulation. So the general sort of technical outline, and I'll, I'll leave the more um, detailed discussion to Chris as he is the expert on this uh, and has the much better elevator pitch version of, of how CDL works technically, um, is that it essentially take a book, a physical book that the library has paid for and owns, scan it, make a PDF with some sort of rudimentary um, optical character recognition. And then when someone wants to check out the book as a patron, you have the option of either checking out the digital copy or checking out the physical copy. Um, and so it preserves the number of copies in circulation at any given time. So it's not creating extra copies of the book. It is just, it is giving the option to check it out as a digital copy for any number of reasons, be that remote accessibility, be that, um, you know, accessibility for blind or print disabled readers, be that, you know, the, the text is too delicate and now it's permanently shelved somewhere, but they make the digital copy available so that they don't risk the physical, any number of reasons. Um, and we've seen a lot of interest from this, from these sort of various underserved populations that have come to rely more and more on the library for access to works that frankly, you know, a lot of cases they need. So, you know, on top of all these sort of default use cases, now that we're in COVID, obviously, this adds a new level of urgency, especially in the context of mass remote learning. Um, schools closed in the spring, thinking they'd be closed for two weeks, uh, you know, back in March. Turns out they were closed for the rest of the school year. Some of them are still closed today. Uh, and so early on, um, you know, there was a big upsurge in teachers who had designed their entire syllabus there at the end of the year. All of a sudden, they lost access to classroom copies, to hundreds of classroom copies of works for which their districts have already paid. Um, they have paid, these are multi-generational copies in some cases, um, and that represents a substantial investment, particularly for school districts uh, in low-income areas um, that just do not have, you know, not the districts where everybody gets an iPad or a MacBook. We're talking inner city districts, low-income districts, um, where you do have to make a copy of Catcher in the Rye last for 10 years <laughs> before you can afford to replace it. Uh, and all of a sudden they've lost access to these books. And so uh, one of the interesting use cases that we've seen is that teachers were able to use CDL to pick up where they left off um, and to be able to actually continue, like create some continuity of learning for their students. Um, you know, we are gonna be working and learning remotely for who knows how long at this point. Uh, and so making sure that these folks have access again, to books that they have spent taxpayer dollars on uh, is, is crucially important. Um, so that's just sort of generally the high level policy discussions that we've had. Uh, I also will not get too uh, into the nitty gritty of the law. Uh, ironically, I was gonna leave that to Dave, uh, as the guy <laughs> who, who wrote the white paper on it. Um, 
but no, I think, you know, from a perspective, we, I think there's an extremely strong fair use case for this. Um, you know, as we like to say in law school, you can always sue, you can't always win. Um, you can bring a lawsuit about anything, <laughs> anything at all. Uh, whether you can win the lawsuit or not is another question. Um, and so it's an interesting case. Um, but, you know, the reality is that fair use at the end of the day is, represents to a lot of folks a degree of legal uncertainty. Um, and so we would much prefer to see a formal, you know, just to clarify a formal provision in the law saying, you know, we think this is unarguably a fair use case as it is to just say, in case anybody was wondering, <laughs> this is absolutely an exception to copyright law. Um, and so, again, there's a lot of sort of running discussion about this right now. It's a, uh, you know, a live topic. Um, and I am happy to answer any questions that folks have. Well, thank you, Meredith. I, I, uh, I would point out to all these book behind me that are definitely not <laughs> material for, for library. They have to be scanned. Some of them are 18th century plays from my uh, other life, and <laughs> they don't exist anywhere except here, maybe. But uh, I'm going to give the floor to an author. He, he works for the Authors Guild, but he's also an author, I understand, and I would uh, welcome, uh, welcome him to join now. Thank you. Thanks, Matt. And it's, uh, I feel like authors are, are often quite underrepresented in these discussions about access and uh, um, you, which is sort of ironic because, you know, books wouldn't exist if authors weren't writing it. And, and um, I, uh, I, 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 I want to respond to some individual comments, but I think I want to sort of give the audience a picture first of how we see at the Authors Guild C Control Digital Lending um, introduction, my name is Amer Kazi. I'm the Director of Policy and Advocacy. Uh, I work for the Authors Guild, which is the largest and oldest professional organization of authors in the U.S. We have about 10,000 members. Uh, we work for them in, uh, an, uh, on issues of publishing contracts, fair pay, copyright protections, tax benefits, and anything that's um, vital to the survival of authorship as a profession and to help authors make a living individually. Um, we, uh, we, we, we uh, take strong objection to um, the, the CDL as a practice and also its legal foundations. We've written a lot about it. Um, I don't think I want to go into them right now. Um, you know, there's a lawsuit going on, as, as everyone knows, against the Internet Archive, uh, which was one of the first adopters of CDL. Um, but I, I do want to point out that the Authors Guild is not uh, unique or alone in this opposition. Actually, virtually every author group, including the National Writers Union, Textbook Author Association, American Society of Journalists and Authors, photographer and publisher organizations have all opposed CDL. Um, in uh, an appeal that was um, helm, uh, headed by the NWU, um, the organizations called it a flagrant violation of copyright and authors' rights. So. Um, to say that CDL is, uh, you know, legal or uh, substantiated is, is, is sort of uh, stretching the conditions a little bit. I think there's a lot that needs to be um, explored uh, in terms of, uh, of, 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 of CDL sort of comportment with uh, the, the copyright balance between the rights of authors and the, the, the public's right to reading. And, and of course, the very important exceptions for libraries and archives. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, it, it is, however, sort of, um, um, sort of baffling. Uh, sometimes I, I find that given this near universal opposition, we almost never hear about uh, in these discussions, never really probe why, um, you know, something that is being challenged by an, one entire group of beneficiaries of copyright law is, uh, you know, is, is, is undergoing more scrutiny. So, uh, that's something that I, you know, we all find a little, little baffling about um, about CDL. Um, I, 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 uh, my uh, colleagues here, uh, preceding colleagues, have mentioned, uh, you know, emphasized that CDL books have um, the b books uh, that are digitized under CDL have no value, and uh, um, in the white paper. Um, the, the white paper says that uh, out of commerce books uh, that are unavailable in the digital marketplace and no one has any plans for revitalization in modern formats. And um, that's actually not entirely true. I and mean, there's, there's a very vibrant flourishing market for 20th century books, for out of commerce books, 
uh, we, uh, the Authors Guild, had a back and print program where we actually brought out a lot of, you know, very strange books, actually s sort of like the books that Meredith mentioned, very specific local histories. Um, and, uh, you know, Open Road was, was providing self-publishing services. So I've, I started out the Authors Guild working as a staff attorney, and I worked with a lot of older authors. Our membership tends to be, you know, have, have, we have a high rate of, of retention in our membership. And uh, I, there, there, I, you know, from personal experience, also from our, the record of our, our member services every year, I can tell you there's at least, I, I would say we get over a hundred queries about like authors wanting to bring their works either back in print or talking to a publisher uh, um, who wants to get their rights once their rights have reverted uh, or looking into self-publishing to bring their books out again. So, so it's, 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 it's sort of an exaggeration to say that, you know, these books have no value at all. I mean, I do understand that we're clumping up a very large volume of material, you know, something from the 18th century plays that, that you mentioned, something that, that, that really requires preservation and, you know, bringing into a digital realm or the author is dead. But, you know, the way CDL has been applied uh, and as illustrated by Internet Archive, it is, it is, it, it's, it, it's it's expanding, it's sprawling over a very, very large number of books that are economically viable and that do have a market. Um, I Just by way of an anecdote, because we mentioned schools reopening and, and uh, um, the, the access to educational material, um, I, I can tell you that in, you know, 20 years ago, and you could make a very, very good living writing textbooks. I was helping a, an older author who um, wrote about, you know, 50 books for McGraw-Hill and, uh, you know, McGraw-Hill wasn't really selling them. So I helped him get the rights back. And now he's looking into creating an educational program based on these very successful books that he had written in the 90s up until 2000. So, so again, just to emphasize that there is very much a market. Um, and, and just to sort of underscore the fact that it's important not to confuse out of print books with books having lost commercial value. I think it's a point that we, uh, you know, when I started the Guild, I also didn't get this distinction, but I do see now that there is this, this, this immense uh, secondary market for books. Uh, CDL's threat to authors' incomes, and, and it is very much a threat, uh, and the ebook market comes from two directions. Um, one is the unauthorized scanning and lending uh, of previously published books. And, uh, you know, sort of, uh, and, and, and um, um, uh, you know, uh, sub substituting the purchasing of uh, library ebook licenses, uh, which, uh, you know, which are expensive, but for reasons that I will go into a little bit down the line. Um, and uh, the more CDL sort of expands, the more we, we fear at the author's skill that the market for the potential exploitation of, um, ebooks uh, books that have not yet entered the digital realm will be completely you know will will, will be fairly badly hurt um, it's uh, in, in looking at the harm um, we think that we have to focus not necessarily on the actual harm of a lost sale of a particular book but the harm on the aggregate as a market uh, which sort of falls under the fourth fair use factor um, uh, if, the, if the value of the work, uh, if, if the, the practice becomes widespread, how does that affect the overall market? And, and we have the example of the Regency case. I don't, I don't have time to go into this right now, but basically based on the fourth fair use factor, uh, Regency found that a market harm was likely because lower price resales were sold to the same customers who would otherwise purchase new licenses. Now I understand there's a distinction between, you know, what libraries do and what this commercial exploitation um, is 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 doing, but I think it, that goes to the legal uh, the foundation of uh, you know just 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 extrapolating from a physical first sale a digital version and then and and the equivalence between a physical version and a digital version. I think that that is under scrutiny right now in the Internet Archive case. Um, the uh, it's um. um and, and, you know, just to go back at why ebook licenses tend to be a little, you know, a little more expensive and, and the, the issues in terms of relicensing 
um, copies of books. Uh, if you, there, you know, are there obvious restrictions on a library getting a, a, a physical copy and being able to lend out within a certain geographic area as libraries have always done. Um, however, uh, the, 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 the fact is a lot, a lot of people are reading uh, virtually now and, and that's not a bad thing, that's a great thing. But, but what that means is also like as access in the digital ecosystem grows, we also have to figure out a way to balance how the, mar the existing market for physical books is affected. And all the publishers have been telling us for years that it is being affected. Um, it, that's one of the reasons why they have structured ebook licensing in a way to um, make up for that difference that ex that happens in the physical market. So, so again, you know, I would I would sort of respectfully, um, um, uh, uh, you know, respectfully uh, say uh, to my prior colleagues that uh, the, the it's it's the, the physical market is not it's 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 not going for it's 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 not functioning as it was before um, the 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 this boom in e-reading and and to account for that difference publishers are coming up with new licensing models uh which you know libraries have been a lot of libraries have been using most libraries have been using them so um so i see uh, you know there's I, I think when we talk about cdl there we, we just okay all right so uh thank you so much for not very politely i think i covered everything um and looking forward to sort of discuss more you can finish a sentence you know <laughs> uh I, <laughs> I, I i think i i was just going to emphasize that 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 authors you know we often find authors and the public to be on the opposite sides of the issue and i personally don't don't see that to be true because authors want access the public wants access how do we how do, how do we how, how do we structure a market that allows authors to continue to to sort of be able to live from writing which is totally not the case and i'm i can tell you as a young person when i look at older contracts i am just they're just like science fiction to me i i, I can never believe that authors were actually going getting paid this much that you could raise kids writing textbooks and writing you know uh, in in magazines um you know that you can you could get like a really good advance it's just it's it's just unbelievable. Uh, I came of age in a in a time when uh, the the default assumption is as an author you don't get paid. <laughs> so so I just wanted to finish on that 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 we have to find a way to to, to retain this balance. Yeah. Well, I would say some people, maybe the publishers, get paid because I was involved in writing textbooks, and I'm telling you, I had to give up my rights. They uh, they were selling those textbooks though and making oh. a lot of money in the. <laughs> Uh, academic institution where they sold them, but you should send this contract to the authors again. You will. Thank you. Uh, th thank you. That was very informative too. Uh, I think that now we have a um, um, Corinne McSherry from the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Is she here? Let me see. Can you all hear me? Okay. Yes. Okay. Hi, Corinne. Go ahead. Um, okay, well, first, thank you very much for, for organizing this discussion. And because I actually think these kinds of events are more fun when you really have discussion, I'm going to keep my remarks pretty brief. Um, and also because there's a lot of us. <laughs> so, um, so I'll be quick. Um, so um, I am legal director for the Electronic Frontier Foundation. And we are an organization based in the United States that advocates for digital rights. Um, and one of the th um, things that we focus on is protecting um, online fair use and free expression. Um, and um, I've been working in this area for 15 years, the entire time I've been at EFF, working on a lot of fair use cases in particular. Um, and I, which leads me to say that uh, EFF is also litigation counsel for the Internet Archive. And as a result of that, I have to be just a little bit careful in terms of my remarks because I have obligations to my client. And um, so I'm just going to be a little bit more careful than I normally would be. EF, usually EFF sends me out and I just say what I think and that's easy enough. Um, but I have to protect privilege and so on. So just a little caveat in advance. Um, I want to start by saying that I completely agree that um, it's extremely important that we um, preserve and support um, balances between, uh, between the rights and the interests of authors and the rights and interests of the general public. 
Um, one of the things that is a reality in the digital age, actually, is that line is, is um, very blurry these days. Many people are authors. Many people are copyright owners um, because we're all writing in a million different ways um, all the time. Um, but, but at any rate, I think it's quite right. We want authors to be paid. We want authors to be able to support themselves so that we can read their works. Absolutely. Um, the whole, and under U.S. law, fair use actually is supposed to be and is the area that, that strikes that balance, the area of copyright law that helps strike that balance and make sure that um, the rights of copyright holders are appropriately balanced against the rights of the general public so that we can have new creativity, we can have new experimentation, and um, so we can have things like controlled digital lending. Um, I'm just going to say a couple things about CDL, um, and then again, I will open it up for discussion. But I do think there's some misinformation out there, and so I want to sort of try to cut through it uh, to some extent. So just a few points. Um, one is, I want to be very clear that what the archive is doing, what could, and, and in association with many, many other libraries and institutions, is really just replicating what libraries have been doing for centuries own to loan, right? So it's a long-standing brick and mortar practice. One person borrows one copy at a time. That is what controlled digital lending is about. Um, it's been going for the archive has been um, doing this since 2011. It's been electronically lending books that were lawfully acquired by purchase or donation, right? Libraries have paid billions of dollars for these books. They have bought these books. These are not pirated books or anything like that. They have lawfully acquired these books and have invested resources in digitizing them so that they can make them more available, so that they can serve their fundamental mission, right? So the archive, um, along with many, many other libraries, are simply trying to figure out how do we fulfill our mission? How do we best serve the public in the digital age? <clears throat> but and they're doing it in ways that is very, really is fundamentally the same as traditional lending. There's nothing really dramatically new here. It's just that now we're in the digital age and everybody is sort of acknowledging that reality and responding to that reality. Now, I would say the one thing that has changed, as everyone in this uh, Zoom room is aware, is we're in a global pandemic. And so we, uh, we have a continuing need for distance learning that I don't think you know, we would have anticipated several years ago, but is the reality now. And that means there's an even more desperate need uh, for digital books. Um, and there is not a corresponding, unfortunately, massive increase in financial resources. <laughs> so um, we have a fundamental problem here. And thank goodness, as they have always done, libraries can step in to fill the gap, to fill that need. And that's what controlled digital lending does. Um, but that said, you know, when authors or publishers don't want their books included in the collection, they're withdrawn. That happens very consistently and very regularly. So if you don't want to be part of the program, you don't have to be part of the program. Now, there's been a lot of back and forth about fair use, so I'm just going to um, touch on that very briefly. Um, so the Intern Archives, this, the CDL program, is in fact protected by the Fair Use Doctrine. Um, and particularly when you think of it as um, enacting and buttressing very traditional library protections under U.S. law and under international law. So if you think about it, the project, what is the project doing? It's serving classic fair use purposes, preservation, access, research, these are all things that are under, well understood under US law to be classic fair uses. Every volume in the collection already published and most are out of print, which I don't think means they're not important works. I hope no one thinks that, but they may also nonetheless be out of print. Um, the entire volumes are lent out, which is something fair use, um, the various doctrine thinks about, but that's what it means to check a book out from the library. That's what that is. Um, again, the books have been bought and paid for every time. And finally, fair use does take account of the public interest. And I don't think there's any real question here that the public is deriving a tremendous benefit from this program. Rights holders gain nothing if the public is deprived of this resource. The public loses a lot. 
um, I think another sort of bit of misinformation that I want to try to dispel is I think there's a few areas where um, some folks have tried to suggest that the archive and the libraries and the archive and uh, the libraries that uh, are participating in controlled digital lending are some sort of pirates or engaging in some kind of theft. You know, there's that kind of narrative that's, I think, profoundly unfortunate. Because again, we're not talking about pirates, we're not talking about thieves, we're talking about libraries simply trying to fulfill their mission. And copyright law does not stand in the way of that, which is a good thing. It's a very good thing. Because if it did, that would mean that in the digital age, publishers will have extraordinary control over what and how we read. I don't think that benefits the public at all. I'm quite sure a court's going to agree with me. <laughs> but you know, we're a little ways away from that ruling. In the meantime, I think it would be wise and would serve the interests of authors and librarians to continue having these discussions in, in a you know open and honest way and you know, move forward to the thing that I think we all want, which is to get books to readers. And I'll close with that, because again, I really want to have the discussion. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much, Corinne. That was very, uh, very interesting. Um, I think we have uh, the archive now uh, with uh, Chris uh, Freeland. Yes. Um, I find him. Yes, here he is. Okay, so I'm going to let you introduce. You, you must have been like buzzing too much. So I'm going to let you. Thanks, Manon. Uh, and the, the Zoom law of odds would, of course, factor in. My neighbor just started a, a leaf blower as, uh, as the session started up. So apologies if you hear background noise. It literally just started like a minute ago. So um, thanks, uh, thanks, Manon, for the, uh, for the session and also to KEI for, uh, for organizing the conversation. So I'm Chris Freeland. I'm a librarian at the Internet Archive, um, and I help manage our controlled digital lending library. Um, before working at the Internet Archive, I was an associate university librarian at Washington University in St. Louis. And before that, I was the director of the Center for Biodiversity Informatics at the Missouri Botanical Garden. So I've been working in partnership with libraries, um, in partnership with the Internet Archive, to digitize books for more than 15 years. So Meredith and Corinne gave a, a really great overview of how CDL works, so I'd actually like to take a little bit of a different approach. Um, I think I may be the only non-lawyer uh, on, the, on the panel. I know I'm not the only librarian, uh, Dave's here, but um, um, I am a hyphenate. So in addition to being a librarian, I'm also uh, what I call a recovering biologist. So my passion for information science and my path towards librarianship started in a botanical research organization. And it's that training that helps inform my work and my passion about controlled digital lending. So I wanna give everyone a, a little background on nomenclature and systematics, which are the science of naming and classifying organisms. And I promise it will connect back to controlled digital lending and especially CDL and a pandemic. So go with me here. Uh, when a scientist describes a new species, like when a botanist goes into the rainforest and encounters a new orchid or a vining plant, that scientist will write a scientific description of the organism and publish that description in a relevant journal or a monograph. And the rules of nomenclature specify for that name to be accepted and valid, the publication has to be deposited in libraries so that it can not only can be made available to scientists, but more importantly, so that can be preserved over time. And so for hundreds of years in science, there has existed this relationship between the creator, the publisher, and the library. And the role of the library is to ensure that the published historical record persists over time. That's what libraries do. We buy, lend, and preserve books and other materials. It's just what we do. Controlled digital lending doesn't disrupt the relationship, that ecosystem that exists between the, the creator, the publisher, and the library. It enhances it. So through controlled digital lending, libraries can provide access uh, to that long history of published work that only exist on paper that don't have a commercially available ebook. And with CDL, our users, we can meet our users where they're needing access, which today is online. And the vast majority of natural history scientists are working around the 
the world, they are not situated near a great printed library. They're working in the developing world and they're using the internet to access resources for their research. And if the books aren't available online, it's as if they don't exist. And during our current global pandemic, all of us are facing those same pressures in accessing information. We've all become those remote scholars who are disconnected from their printed library. So I gave you an example of where libraries fit in natural history science. But you know, if we, we can take a step back and that same uh, ecosystem, that same triangle exists across all publishing, not just uh, scientific publishing. And the role of the library across those relationships is the same, is to provide access to and preservation of the published record so that we have trusted repositories of vetted information that we can refer to over time, over centuries. So here's where it all comes together. In our work, we have relationships with commercial and academic publishers that don't have access to their publishing history. It's not uncommon to talk with a publisher, especially one that has a long uh, publishing history uh, or has been publishing materials for a long time, to find out that they don't have copies of materials that are on their backlists. They didn't keep copies. The library did. That's the role of the library. And so in that triangle relationship, in that ecosystem, it's the library that's charged with preservation. And so we've had a number of publishers who have opted in to control digital lending. And when we've gone to gather their publications um, and make them available through digitization, we have to go to the library to get them because that's where the works have been preserved. So we've heard from authors and from other creators that they want their works in our lending library, in CDL, made available through controlled digital lending so that people can discover their books and can check them out online. And so I want to leave uh, you with that ecosystem between the, the creator, the publisher, and the library. And as visibility of controlled digital lending has increased, and especially as libraries and schools have been closed or disrupted, uh, had disrupted service due to COVID-19, we've had a steady stream of publishers and authors who have come to us and asked us, the Internet Archive, how they can get their works into our controlled digital lending library. Not taking books out, but putting books in. These creators and these publishers, they see that CDL is a way to reach new audiences, a way of getting their works in the hands of the researchers and the readers who might not have access to a public library, who might not be able to read a book, might need assistive devices, might need other ways of making uh, information available to them because they have a print disability. Um, and they may not, you know, may not be able to get to a library because of uh, uh, limitations in proximity or enclosure. And, and so from a library perspective, CDL helps us fulfill our role in that ecosystem. We can provide better access to our collections through controlled digital lending. We can meet users where they're working or where they're reading, and we can continue to fill our centuries long role of owning and preserving the published record for generations to come. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Chris. It was uh, great. I think Lina would be very happy to hear what you say <laughs> in terms of naming. You know, we French people were very proud of that. Um, now, uh, I think we have a uh, Kaylin Nagel from USPIRG, who is a, a member of TACD, and uh, she is uh, with the education, the textbook campaign, right? Yes. Go ahead. Uh, and I am and, and also, Chris, I am also not a lawyer, so you're not alone here. Um, but thank you so much for having me. I'm here with the U.S. Public Interest Research Group, and I'm really excited to be here because U.S. Purpose is one of the founding uh, organizations of this organization, so it's a great opportunity. Um, and then one of, I'm, I'm actually going to be speaking from a pretty narrow space. Um, since the early 2000s, U.S has been researching the problems in the textbook marketplace and advocating for policies that support open textbooks and open educational resources. So obviously people checking books out are probably the most numerous stakeholders in this conversation. Um, and my comments are gonna be a little more narrowly focused on what's going on in college campuses and student stakeholders in particular. So. Uh, in the U.S., textbooks are prohibitively expensive. Um, the, from the 1970s to the early 2000s, textbook costs have rise, risen at three times the rate of inflation. And while the curve has evened out in the past couple years, 
the U.S. College Board still recommends students set aside about $1,200 a year for textbooks alone. Um, this situation got this way through uh, some limited competition in the textbook marketplace and the consumers of textbooks, students not really having a say in what they're assigned, which makes sense because educators choose that. Um, these high costs have impacts on students' education, which classes they take, how many they take, as well as their lives outside of the classroom, from skipping meals to working more shifts. And students often opt to not buy these assigned textbooks at all. Um, campus libraries have been on the forefront of this issue. And I work really closely with librarians and their associations and their leaders in um, working to create systematic change to address this by advocating for funding for open textbooks and often administering grants to faculty who want to make the switch to open. Um, but they are also on the front lines of providing the resources to students who can't afford textbooks through things like course reserves where copies of assigned textbooks are kept on the library at the library um, before the pandemic students already had limited access to these reserves of physical textbooks they can access them for only a few hours um, at a time and are usually not allowed to take these textbooks outside of the library this situation obviously has huge disadvantages for non-traditional students who, even, who have even more time restrictions than traditional students. And librarians have been trying to make more copies available, but they have tight budgets and competing priorities. Um, so right now, students need these services more than ever. This summer, youth unemployment was double the previous summer. And this is the money most students rely on to buy their materials for the next school year. The increase in need for course reserves, just as access is doubly limited by public health needs and difficulties of getting digital copies for books or the near impossibility that some librarians talk to me about, about getting these digital copies, just adds a lot of fuel to what students are going to, through and makes it even more challenging. So adding to these stretch demands, one of the things that um, I was told a librarian in Connecticut was going through was, Books that are returned to the library have to go through a 36 hour quarantine before they can be lent out again as a public health measure. This means that students only have access to these course reserve textbooks maybe two or three times a week, usually for only a few hours at a time, which is very limited. Um, digital lending is obviously a solution to that pub public health concern element and to get students these access to these books that the libraries already have on reserve. Um, and last fall, just to let students kind of speak for themselves a little bit, we ran a national survey covering 80 US institutions on textbook affordability. Um, and what we found was 63% of students had continued to skip buying textbooks and 10% of students reported skipping meals in order to afford their materials. That was before the pandemic. We also gave students a chance to give short answer responses for their experience and dozens and dozens of students talk about how they rely on library course reserves, which they no longer have access to. So I wanted to use their voices in particular and share a couple of their responses really quickly. Um, so one of the students said, I spend a significant amount of time each term accessing materials available at the library, so I won't have to buy textbooks. Um, an expensive access code can make or break my term, and I already use food stability services to make ends meet. And then another student said, if possible, I rent textbooks through the library exchange program. However, these rentals do not allow for renewals, so I end up having to return the books and scramble to find a solution midterm. And then it's frustrating when something could be available for free online, but instead professors require you to buy a hard copy. Also, the books available at the library are life-changing. So that's kind of how students are talking about their own experience of accessing these resources at libraries and how necessary they are for their success. Um, so we're in unusual circumstances and students are particularly vulnerable. Um, relying on library resources is a lifeline and the difference between passing or failing for many students. 
Expanding what's possible through CDL benefits students significantly, especially now that avenues and access to textbooks are just shut down and not available. So I wanted to just focus on that in particular, but that's all I have, and I'm really excited for the discussion portion. Well, thank you very much, uh, Kaylin. Uh, this, uh, this limited access when books are on reserve uh, reminded me of some nightmares of when I was a student and when I was teaching too, where students would rush to the reserve to make sure they would get access to the book. But um, there's also the problem of people who are not enrolled, of course, and I think it's, a, it's, a, it's not what you address, but it's, it's important also to see some people who lost their job during the pandemic and had to be uh, retrained or tried to find a new job. And libraries uh, uh, are a very important place where people can get some, uh, some new information about training and training itself. So I think that uh, Thank you for doing that for students. It's, uh, it's really a nightmare um, to have no access when you're supposed to produce papers and, and so on. Now we have uh, James Love from the Knowledge Ecology International, also the IP co-chair of uh, at TACD. Is Jamie on? Turn on my... <clears throat> uh, thank you very much. I, I, I think one of the issues uh, there's two, I think, important issues that are raised in this. First of all, can you hear me okay? Is my volume loud enough? It's all right. Uh, what, what is the issue of, is controlled digital lending done under an exception to the copyright law? Is, is you know, how does, how, does, uh, how does that work? Uh, some of the controlled digital lending that you see right now is done under licenses. For example, uh, some of the local libraries will do it they have licenses with publishers, but the more controversial area and the thing that's part of the litigation with the Internet Archives is to what extent do the copyright laws, exceptions clauses allow uh, libraries to do controlled digital lending uh, uh, through the exceptions. And I think this is a, a really important issue because it really goes to the, to the issue of ownership and the role of libraries going forward. I think that the the, uh, the pandemic is forcing us to confront a lot of these issues. <clears throat> Secondly, uh, it, it isn't only about uh, the normal case. It's about what happens to the copyright law in the time of a pandemic. And in that respect, I think it's, it, it's useful to reflect upon other areas of the economy that are responding to the pandemic. One area is uh, in the United States is the uh, Defense uh, uh, Production Act, where the uh, the President of the United States has issued a series of orders and, and executive actions under the Defense Production Act to essentially nationalize or to intervene in markets, not, not in the publishing area, but in all sorts of other areas. For example, even uh, there's one, one recent uh, uh, order that was done in April that had to do with waiving certain worker safety rules as it related to the production of, 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 of beef, pork, and poultry. Uh, the government's also uh, moved in the direction of uh, manufacturing for things that are protective gear. On September 1, uh, this, uh, this month, uh, they, uh, on a different topic, uh, the, the uh, Center for Disease Control in the United States halted evictions nationwide. So if you talk about intellectual property, there's nothing more property-like uh, than real estate. And uh, if, if what, what the CD do is, CDC has done is that they extended uh, and they've implemented new guidance on preventing people from being evicted from their homes during the pandemic. The, uh, the CARES Act itself had a number of areas that also uh, dealt with this issue. Uh, some of the protections on evictions that had to do with whether or not you receive federal rental assistance from a voucher or grant program or if your landlord received assistance from a federally subsidizing housing program, or if your rental home or apartment has a federally backed mortgage. Now there's a, a really large number of mortgages out here that do have federal guarantees. So that was a pretty extensive area of protection. There's also provisions in the CARES Act, which was done in the United States, so that it would protect people that were paying mortgages themselves. They weren't, they weren't tenants, they were actually homeowners, but they had a mortgage on their house. And in these particular areas, because of the pandemic, because of the emergency, 
you were allowed to have forbearance and basically not pay on your mortgage and, and you wouldn't lose your house. That was really an important thing for a lot of people. So, and something as fundamental as a mortgage in a house, the government intervened in the market and they basically made it so the rules would be different during the pandemic and more favorable for access uh, to housing in that particular case or maintaining your ownership. Student loans have been postponed and the interest has been waived on student loans. And for a lot of young people, this is a pretty significant part of their budget. And it was uh, uh, really an important uh, intervention as far as the uh, pandemic is concerned. Uh, the Bank of, uh, there's been a lot of action by private parties. Uh, the Bank of America, for example, uh, has an announcement that they're using some of the profits from the company to support the Khan Academy to deliver a virtual classroom experience during the school closure. So that's a case where a private company, the Bank of America, reached out to extend education opportunities for people uh, and help fund some of the uh, cost of extending these uh, services. Uh, the TRIPS agreement itself, which is part of the overall international framework, and I apologize for kind of skipping around on this, um, um, but I'm going to do my best. Uh, the TRIPS agreement is the overall WTO agreement on intellectual property rights for copyrights, trademarks, patents, etc. And uh, in the area of patents, which is a, a, a really an important area, the WTO agreement, probably the most important part of the agreement in terms of motivating the, the, the adoption of the TRIPS agreement. Uh, there's a particular provision in the compulsory licensing section in Article 31 of the TRIPS. And it says that normally efforts to attain authorization for right holder, you have to do that on reasonable commercial terms before you have to make an effort before you, uh, in a reasonable amount of time, uh, before you issue a compulsory license. So in a normal compulsory licensing case, you first have to try and negotiate a voluntary license and the standard has to be reasonable in commercial terms. Um, under a case of uh, extreme urgency or, an, uh, 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 however, or in a national emergency, which th this pandemic is, those requirements are waived by the WTO. So within, and this is also true for, uh, not necessarily in the United States, but around the world, most governments will have fast track procedures expedited procedures and different rules for the granting of a compulsory license on a patent than they do uh, when, there's, when there's not an emergency. So the patent law is considered different in those cases. The USPTO itself has adopted certain rules related to the pandemic, particularly favorable to people that are trying to maintain the ownership of their patents or trying to get new patents. Uh, they've, uh, they've had uh, uh, concessionary things on the fees that have to be paid by patent holders and, uh, and they've had some expedited procedures. They've also done this in the area of trademarks and they have an expedited examination program for trademarks and service mark applications. The Copyright Office has uh, issued a notice and, they have, to, and they've, uh, they have a new section, section 710 of the Copyright Act, which authorizes, uh, that, 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 I mean, they're implementing uh, a section that exists to, uh, uh, in, in that particular section on a temporary basis, the register of copyright can toll, waive, adjust, or modify any timing provisions or provisional provisions of the Copyright Act if she determines that a national emergency declared by the president generally disrupts or suspends the ordinary function of the copyright system or any component thereof. And in exercising this authority, the register shall consider the scope and severity of the particular national emergency and a specific effect with respect to particular, particular provision and shall tailor any remedy accordingly. In this respect, on um, uh, what, what the Copyright Office has done is they've uh, announced adjustments to the timing provisions relating to registration claims and termination notices of persons affected by COVID-19. and also related to section 115 notices of intention and statement of accounts of entities impacted by COVID-19. On March 19th, 2020, the Office of, Bu Office of Management Budget and OMB issued a memorandum M2017, administrative relief for recipients and applicants of federal aid financial assistance directed, directly impacted by the 
by the, 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 the by coronavirus due to loss of operations. And this was a sweeping rule that affected all sorts of people that dealt with the federal government. Major publishers have taken down paywalls for coronavirus coverage. The New England Journal of Medicine is an example that all of their COVID-19 pandemic uh, information is now available freely immediately. The Washington Post is an example of many newspapers have done this. They have waived uh, the paywall for all the coronavirus coverage. Uh, the president issued an executive order 13910, uh, which delegated to the Department of Health and Human Services the ability to uh, designate scarce goods that are particularly scarce in the contact of COVID. These are physical things like N95 uh, face masks, ventilators, certain drug products, sterilization devices, disinfecting devices, medical gowns, personal protective equipment. And then there's a, a series of actions that have been taken by states relating to pre, uh, price gouging, where the government would not normally involve in an in, in issue of, of, of regulating prices, but things are different in the pandemic. I mention all of these things because within the copyright system, I'm gonna wind up right now. Uh, the question is, should the rules be like completely the same in the copyright system, despite the COVID, when the rest of the, the, rest of the economy is trying to be more flexible? And we would argue and it's our opinion, because of the closure of schools, because of the closure of libraries, because of the extreme changes that have taken place in access to library resources and the, and, the, and the necessity of people to be outside of the classroom thing in college as well as undergraduate, I mean, as well as, uh, uh, as, as, as K through 12 education, that there should be more flexibility in the copyright area during the pandemic than there is in normal times. Thank you. Oh, by the way, I will, I will share a link to the, my notes on, uh, on these citations. Well, thank you, uh, Jamie. Um, well, it's a, it's a good, uh, <laughs> good. We have Chris Weston from the U.S. Copyright Office. He is the uh, Senior Counsel for Policy and International Affairs. So he will help us make, make the bridge between uh, the U.S. and the uh, other part of the world, I hope. Uh, Chris, I think you can, uh, you can take the floor now. Thank you. Okay. Uh, can everybody hear me? Great. So um, I want to talk a little bit about not necessarily um, CDL specifically, but just some of our views on how to best make materials available during the pandemic and the associated closure of schools and libraries. Um, our views on CDL are explained in our May 15th, 2020 letter to Senator Udall, which is available on copyright.gov. But I want to mention a few other things that uh, are are relevant to the question of uh, distance education. Um, so first of all, um, this has been mentioned a couple of times, but there are significant efforts by publishers and also nonprofit entities that uh, are trying to ameliorate the lack of physical access to cultural materials uh, by providing free or discounted access to e-resources such as e-textbooks, regular e-books, and read aloud events for smaller children. Um, there is one example is JSTOR, which is a nonprofit that archives and provides access to scholarly journals. They provided expanded institutional access, including access to the entire collection, regardless of the institution's licensing agreement, provided free access to select journal articles to the general public, and increased their free read online access limit from six to 100 articles per month. Um, you can go online, there's uh, publishers, library and museum associations all have information on what they and their members are doing to serve as much content as possible online in consideration of the need for virtual learning during the pandemic. Um, talking about copyright law specifically, there are four exceptions currently in the copyright law that can be put to use for distance learning. A fair use is obviously one. Um, but I want to focus on, not necessarily focus, but I mentioned the other three. One is section 121, uh, which uh, provides copies for the print disabled, uh, making copies and distributing those copies. And that's recently been enhanced by the Marrakesh Treaty. There's the section 108 exceptions for libraries and archives, which the Copyright Office recently recommended uh, revising and uh, enhancing the ability of libraries and archives to make works available digitally off site. Um, and then what I want to talk about mostly is the TEACH Act exceptions for distance learning. Um, so, excuse me while I scroll down my notes. Uh, so this is sections 110.2 and 112.F of the Copyright Act. Um, 
And uh, we think that these, this act, uh, while it does have some limitations, it does provide significant flexibility to schools and teachers who need to engage in distance learning. Um, I think it's helpful to look at the legislative history, first of all, of the TEACH Act. Uh, the, it was enacted in 2002 and the House Committee on the Judiciary's report said, and I'll quote, for our nation to maintain its competitive edge, it will need to extend education beyond children and young adults to lifelong learning for working adults and to reach all students of all income levels in cities and rural settings in schools and on campuses in the workplace at home and, and at times selected by students to meet their needs. And obviously this, this need is, is just magnified by the pandemic. And it's important to keep this broad mandate in mind as we look at the specific provisions of the TEACH Act, which is intended to allow a maximum amount of the use of digital education technologies while maintaining safeguards against the widespread and unauthorized distribution of copyrighted works. So uh, the first thing to know about the TEACH Act is it only applies to works lawfully made or acquired. And there's another limit which it doesn't apply to works for that are produced or marketed primarily for performance or display as part of mediated instructional activities transmitted by digital networks. So for example, the electronic textbook that is specifically marketed for use in distance learning would be off limits, but this still leaves a lot of material available for use, including um, the sort of uh, 20th century um, digital memory hole uh, works that were talked about in reference to CDL. Um, in terms of how much of a work can be used, it depends on the use that's being made of it for performance of a work. So showing part of a movie or reading from a book, you can use as much as you want of a non-dramatic literary or musical work, or you can use reasonable or limited portions of any other type of work. Uh, so that's if you're performing a work, you're reading it aloud, you're, you're uh, broadcasting it, so, so to speak, for a display, so showing a picture or illustration or pro pro projecting text from a book on a screen, you can use an amount comparable to what would be displayed in a live classroom setting. So the use also has to be or under the supervision of an instructor in the course of a regular class session of a nonprofit educational institution, and that includes student performances and displays. Um, and this is important, this fourth point, which it, the TEACH Act allows schools to make copies of digital works and it also allows them to digitize analog works for transmission to students. Um, one of the limits on that is if uh, no digital version is available to the institution. So again, I think this aligns with some of the aims of CDL, where the idea is to make things available that are not already available digitally. And that is the aim of this portion of the TEACH Act as well. Um, some of the more uh, controversial parts of the TEACH Act are some of the controls that schools have to put on their, uh, their works. First of all, they have to limit transmission to students enrolled in the class. They also have to apply TPMs to ensure both that students don't retain the work for longer than the class session and to prevent unauthorized further dissemination of the work. Um, the school also should not circumvent any TPMs that are already present on the work. Um, now, one thing that uh, I was asked before I, uh, before this, this, this webinar was about the scalability of the TEACH Act. And I don't see any reason why thousands of schools can't simultaneously use the TEACH Act as a basis for conducting online classes. Um, you know, it's certainly scalable. There's nothing about um, if one school is doing it, then another school can't do it or anything like that. Um, and it also bears mentioning that uh, fair use can also operate in addition to the TEACH Act. So there may be circumstances where the TEACH Act exception only gets you part of the way to your goal and fair use can be used to fill in the gaps. So uh, I see I'm almost out of time, but I look forward to our discussion and uh, thank you very much to KEI for uh, enabling this discussion. Well, thank you very much. That's a, a good wrap up on the uh, Distance Education Teach Act because <laughs> very few people actually pay attention to this act uh, until very recently. Nobody really knew what it was about, but it, it's uh, it's very good. It made me think we, we should have called uh, Kenneth Cruz on board too. <laughs> but anyway, uh, that uh, is the end of our uh, panelists. If there are questions or comments, I'm looking at the chat. If somebody wants to address a, a direct question, you just let me know.
raise your hand. I think the uh, U.S. took a big chunk, but that's because we're bigger. And also because we're actually doing a lot of CDL and uh, we have the T-Shock too, it's true. Any, any question? There was a question about the lawsuit, but that is not decided yet. So uh, we don't really have to answer this, I think. So uh, I think it's gonna be uh, um, Federico Oliveira da Silva from BIOC, who's gonna talk, uh, monitor the uh, EU perspective. Yeah. Fred, on. Yeah. yeah. Hi, Manon. Okay. Thanks a lot. Oh, I'm, uh, I'm gonna disappear <laughs> for a while. Thanks a lot. Huh? It's, uh, it's very interesting, very informative to, to know well, what is happening in the US. I have to admit that now I'm, I'm quite curious to see what will be our speaker's uh, uh, reaction to, to what is happening in the US, but also to know more about what is happening in Europe. So uh, yeah, just, just very briefly, I'll introduce myself. I'm Federico. I'm, um, I'm a legal officer at BILC, the European Consumer Organization, which is a member of TACV uh, as well. And I, I work on, on copyright issues. So we, we have uh, three uh, very good speakers uh, to, to give us the, the EU perspective about uh, digital lending. Uh, each of them will have uh, 10 minutes to, to speak and then at the end we'll have uh, 10 minutes for questions. Uh, you can always draft the questions on the chat uh, if you like and uh, if not you can also ask them orally afterwards. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I'll be monitoring the chat, so uh, don't hesitate to type your questions while, uh, while the speakers are, are ongoing. But yeah, so uh, we just heard the situation in the US and uh, now the idea is to understand what is happening in the European Union. Uh, what is uh, the current situation under EU law, uh, if there is any case law. Has there been any legal friction uh, during the, the, the lockdown or over the past few months? Is CDL a concept known at all in the European Union or not? And uh, overall, how is the situation for, for, for the different users? I mean, for the readers, for the researchers and, and for students. And finally, also a question, is there a need, of course, to adapt uh, uh, any rules to, to, to exceptional circumstances such as, as the pandemic? So these are some of the questions that we'll try to answer. And uh, we'll start with, uh, with Julia Reda. I can see that uh, Julia is already online. Julia, thanks a lot for, for joining us and for accepting our invitation. Uh, I, I assume you'll give a little bit more the, the German perspective, perspective but uh, feel free to explore also the EU perspective and to give us your view on, uh, on what is the situation for users at the moment. Thanks a lot. Sure, thank you Federico and uh, it was really interesting following the first panel as well and I think it's uh, an excellent time to have this transnational uh, exchange because I think uh, e-lending or digital lending has really become more important than ever in the pandemic and uh, quite often the European legal system, the European copyright system is uh, criticized for being ill-suited to adapt to technological developments because we don't have an open norm like the fair use exception. But uh, digital lending is actually a example where the European Court of Justice has adopted a, trans, um, a technologically neutral interpretation of the law and so perhaps some of you may be surprised that um, digital lending controlled digital lending is already legal under EU law this has been litigated all the way to the European Court of Justice and it is also in fact uh, uh, legal under the public lending exception in Germany but nevertheless, uh, public libraries in Germany are not using this exception because they fear that they do not have the necessary legal certainty. And I think this is uh, quite an important point to make that even when the legal situation is relatively clear, it is just very, very difficult for libraries as public institutions to go out and take even the smallest risk. And so in that, I apologize for the cat. Uh, and <laughs> I think in that respect, um, the U.S. is quite lucky to have an institution uh, such as uh, the Internet Archive that uh, is quite innovative in um, 
uh, taking on new forms of providing the public with access to knowledge. So uh, we have this court case in the European Union called uh, Vereinigung Openbare Bibliotheken, or just VOB. This was um, a case brought by public libraries in the Netherlands. Um, the occasion was that the Dutch government was planning to introduce legislation that would allow a single national digital library to do e-lending. And uh, the public library sued against that because they, this law would not have allowed everybody to do uh, e-lending. Um, I'm happy to share uh, the, the case after I've spoken, but if somebody can do so in the meantime, um, that would be great. So uh, in this case, the Dutch libraries were arguing that the general public lending right already applies to ebooks so long as the principle of one copy, one lending person applies. So that means that uh, somebody can only uh, download the copy for a limited time and that it's one person at a time. And um, the European Court of Justice essentially agreed. So uh, the European Court of Justice said that uh, the public lending directive has to be uh, interpreted in a technology neutral way and uh, the public lending right already applies to uh, ebooks as well. So uh, in Germany, the, uh, the exception for public lending is almost word for word the same as in the Netherlands. So actually, I would argue there is not even a need for clarification. It is already quite clear that if the Dutch public lending exception allows the lending of ebooks uh, with the use of DRM, the same should be true for Germany. But nevertheless, uh, the German public libraries have been afraid that if they were to use this uh, exception in this way, they would nevertheless get sued by publishers. And just the fact of being sued is already quite uh, a big problem for a public institution. So they have been asking the German legislator for years and years and years to simply change the law and put in the word ebook so that it's absolutely clear. And this has just not been high on the list of priorities of the government, so it has not happened. And I think this example shows pretty clearly that um, libraries are at a structural disadvantage in the way that copyright law is structured because they rely on exceptions. So the assumption is always that everything is forbidden until it's explicitly allowed, which makes it very difficult to um, even test uh, and take a calculated risk. But in this case, the Dutch libraries actually did take that calculated risk. They did litigate this question and the European Court of Justice made a very clear decision. So at this point, uh, I would hope that the libraries would go ahead and do digital lending under this exception. But I think also the European Commission has a role to play in perhaps providing guidance that makes it clear that member states do not need to actively change their law in order to allow e-lending, provided that they have implemented the exception for public lending under the Lending and Rental Directive already. Because this was the case in the Netherlands, uh, the Dutch legislator had not considered e-books at the time that the Rental and Lending Directive was implemented. However, the European Court of Justice said that there is nothing in the wording that would prevent it from being applied to e-books provided that uh, it's controlled digital ending. So um, I think, yeah, this is the main point that, that I want to make, that even in this quite dire situation, it's extremely difficult for libraries to take any sort of calculated risk. And so the more legal certainty that uh, governments or public institutions can give them in order to simply do what they're already allowed to do under the law, that would be extremely helpful. I will leave it at that and um, looking forward to the discussion. 
thanks a lot Julia, for this if i may already uh, ask you a question I mean, it's really interesting what you were saying that there's a there's a law in place and that nevertheless public libraries are still afraid of uh, of uh, using that because of the lack of legal clarity and has there been any development on that issue over the past months because you've been saying that it has been for for the past few years mm. just to ask if in over the past months this has somehow resurfaced more uh, intensively again um I think the main thing that happened in Germany during the pandemic was uh, that there were some agreements between libraries and publishers mm -hmm. about the uh, amount of uh, remuneration or a compensation to be paid for certain compensated exceptions. And that was certainly helpful, but it was for a very short time. I think it was really for May, uh, April and May so really at the height of the lockdown mm -hmm. but um none of the structural issues have been yeah. addressed okay okay thank you very much uh, uh Frederick, sorry fred you you're muted <laughs> sorry <laughs> of course this was going to happen uh so we'll then move to our, our second speaker uh Séverine Dussolier, who's a, a professor at the University of Sciences Po uh, in Paris. Uh, Céline, I saw you were here earlier. Yeah, I can see you now. Hi, uh, thanks for, for joining us. And, uh, and uh, our question is really, what is your view on EU law? I guess you, you, you have also an interpretation of the EU jurisprudence. And uh, also you can have, uh, if you can give us a perspective on how the EU framework fits in on the, on the EU international treaties, that would be much appreciated. Thank you very much. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, and thank you also for having invited me. Um, Julia has made my life easier because she already introduced the VOB case. Um, but if I may, I, I, I would like to give a broader view of the European Union uh, framework uh, in terms of e-lending. Actually, what is interesting is that we are in a completely reverse situation of the US because in US, traditional uh, lending by public libraries is uh, is actually authorized under the first sale doctrine. The books that are acquired by, by libraries can be easily lent out. In Europe, actually, lending, public lending, is, has to be authorized by copyright owners. This is a principle, but this is a principle from which the states can derogate, and all of them decided to do, by organizing a sort of compulsory licensing for public lending. So actually, Lending is under copyright, but due to an exception, it is authorized as soon as there is some compensation for copyright owners, including authors. The, the, the compensation is actually rather low in, in most countries. So what happened with, with public lending is that, uh, with digital lending, is that yes, the, the Court of Justice has authorized it too, saying that there was no difference to be made between traditional lending and uh, e lending of, of e-books. Um, the issue with that decision that I proof most generally uh, is that the, the, the Court of Justice was really bold in, in deciding that there was some equivalence between one copy, one user model of ebook lending and the traditional book lending that happened in libraries, but it didn't give any guidelines of how to do it. So that's part also, so Julia is completely right by saying that libraries don't want don't dare to do it despite the blueprint that was given by by the, the court of justice for many reasons first because the court of justice just said that the dutch law should be interpreted as including e-lending but still it means that national lawmakers have to transpose that into their law first by even even if you say that that there is a broad interpretation that can be made of lending, you need to put in place a scheme for compensating authors and copyright owners. And most of the countries, all countries, haven't done that. So it is a bit difficult to say to libraries, go ahead and 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 lend your ebooks. That is one reason. The other reason is that it the, the decision doesn't say anything about. Uh, reproduction of books. So there is nothing in the decision that says that libraries can digitize their book to, 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 to check them out to patrons. And this is a big blind spot of the decision in my view because it doesn't say 
anything about how libraries could do that in practice. So it means that libraries, if they want to, uh, to lend ebooks, they need to have ebooks that allow that. And actually, it's not, it's not the case. Most ebooks that the libraries get are, are, come with um, licensing conditions attached. And so those licensing conditions generally organize uh, possible e-lending, um, not under a copyright exception, as public lending is, but under market-based conditions. You know? And if they just buy regular e-books from the market, those e-books will be formatted not to be able to be read in multiple devices. So actually, even though the Court of Justice said, go ahead, you can, you can also uh, make lending of ebooks in practice is not possible without the intervention of publishers of those ebook or even with without the intervention of those aggregators and platforms uh, responsible for e-lending. I was a bit surprised that in the US panel, there was not so much that was said, it was one of the questions I wanted to ask about the, about the role of those platforms and about the licensing conditions that are actually uh, put upon uh, public libraries to engage in such uh, ebook uh, lending. So, but I, will, I, I can come back to that. What is really, really interesting, I, Thing in the, no, I, I should say another thing first. There are two other other possibilities under EU law, and that refers to um, something that was said before in the US panel. Is the fact that um, there are um, schemes in EU law for facilitating the making available of orphan works and out of commerce works by libraries, and it should be added, I think, to the the issue of e-lending because it means that libraries are also under a specific status that uh, allow them to make available um, um, orphan works and art of commerce. Also, I should have said that it concerns public libraries. So actually, even if we had a sort of internet archive uh, service in Europe, it wouldn't enter under the public libraries definition. So we have a very um, limited definition of public libraries, I would say, that is that really refers to the to the public institution that we know as brick and mortar libraries in a way. And so that limits a bit what, what is possible under EU law. The last point I would like to make, I didn't check my time, so tell me if I'm too long. Okay, perfect. So the, what is really interesting in the decision by the Court of Justice is the fact that, um, and it comes from the Advocate General, that was really, really um, insisting on the fact that libraries have a specific role. And that specific role is as all, uh, all people who have intervened so far have repeated, is a role of making knowledge and culture available to everybody. And that role shouldn't be left to the market only. That the, the libraries have a specific position in the way people access to books or access to cultural content or to research content or educational content. And I think it is really, really interesting because in my view, there are different ways of accessing copyrighted content. There is the market, the general market. There is the second hand market. And the libraries is a way of access that is completely not mediated by market. So it's left for, um, so there is no intercession of, of market, which makes everybody being able to get access to book, whatever its um, physical capability, its uh, geographic location, its financial mean, etc. And it's particularly important in times of pandemic, of course. But it means that then the libraries, and this, is, this was said very clearly by the Advocate General, by the Court of Justice, it said that it's particularly important that we sustain the role of public libraries in the digital environment, because the digital environment will be the only place during a pandemic where people can get access to, uh, to cultural content. And I think of students, of course, um, in, in, that, in that frame. Um, so that means also that the, the role of, of public libraries is also to, uh, you know, we, we shift the financial burden of getting access to books to uh, public libraries, but also that means to taxpayers' money and, and, and public budgets. 
And in times of pandemic and in the times to come, that budget will be restricted for those type of uses in some countries, maybe in some countries more than in others. And that should also raise our concern because uh, it means that, um, of course, there will be a cost for public libraries in organizing e-lending. You know, we shouldn't be naive and think that it will be for free. No, it will not be for free. But if we leave only the publishers and the platform decide on the condition to get access to ebooks by libraries uh, without any public policy consideration, then we might have a very disbalanced uh, environment where, for instance, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm coming from a rich institution, educational institution, so it's true that during the pandemic we could easily expand our access to research databases and books to all our students. But I know a lot of other university that could not afford to do that, you know. So it means that uh, because the library should not be, and I repeat myself again, that I think it's really crucial, that it's not only a market actor, it needs to have financial condition to get access to books, to be able to provide those books and this other material on an equal base for everybody. And I would like maybe in the discussion to come back to the licensing condition, because I think it's a crucial point to see whether the licensing condition that are uh, right now imposed by publishers and aggregators to e-lending are fair enough for all public libraries. There is a very interesting uh, study that has been made by Rebecca Giblin in, the, in Australia with a team of researchers that has proven that she has surveyed uh, five English-speaking countries, so maybe it limits the analysis, but um, she showed that in terms of public availability, most books are available on the existing platforms that are provided by publishers, but in terms of price, there are a lot of concerns about the price that are uh, uh, that are imposed by publishers that will make uh, some, some public libraries left out of the systems. I will stop here. Uh, it's like on time. <laughs> uh, thanks a lot. Uh, that was uh, really interesting. And, um, and I, I'm really curious to see if uh, the US colleagues will now read the, the judgment because uh, uh, indeed I, I wouldn't be surprised if at the end the, the, the US law case would have a similar approach to the role of libraries uh, in, in societies in democracy. So uh, I, I didn't know the advocate general opinion, and, but uh, but very interesting. I, I posted the link. so. I see that, uh, I can assume that some of our colleagues will, will read it as well. So we really have one question, but we'll leave it to after the intervention of the European Commission. I see that uh, Marco is already here. Yeah, Marco, thanks a lot. So uh, our third and, and final speaker is Marco Giorello. Marco is um, the head of unit of the copyright unit at the European Commission. So for our US colleagues, it's more complex than that, but the European Commission is sort of a, a, a can be compared to a European government. Again, it's more complex than that, but uh, that's how I, I would frame it. Um, uh, Marco, I don't know if uh, I cannot see you. Ah, here you are. Yeah, now I can see you. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, uh, just uh, you were not here at, at the beginning, just let you know that there were already some mentions, some, some uh, people mentioned the, the European court case and uh, how the European Commission has a role to play, namely by introducing some guidelines to clarify the the European court case and the, and the current uh, European law. So uh, you have the floor. Yes, uh, thanks a lot and good afternoon, everybody. Yes, I am. I'm sorry, I, I could not follow the first panel and I joined when uh, Julia was already speaking, but, uh, but uh, I, I, I take that I, let's say, I listen to, to most of the interventions, at least on, uh, on this panel. Uh, as, as other speakers have said, I think, uh, you know, uh, I will not, uh, uh, I will not go through European law uh, as, uh, as I was intending to do, because I, I see that uh, both Julia and Severina actually have already done so. So I will, I will just give some consideration, improvising a little bit, <laughs> actually based already on, on what I heard. First of all, I think uh, that uh, I am really grateful uh, for this discussion and it may look like something that we always have to say, Federico, but uh, uh, 
I'm grateful for, for, for the invitation and for the idea that uh, I don't know if it was uh, your idea, Frederico, or someone else uh, to discuss e lending, because this is a topic which uh, we have not discussed actually in Europe uh, for, for some time, actually. And I would say that we have, uh, we have not discussed much since this judgment of 2017. So my, my, my first element is that, uh, you know, this is a topic that uh, was uh, uh, very much in the public sphere discussion uh, in Europe a uh, few years ago, actually, um, before this judgment came. Uh, this was pretty much also the time when the European Commission was uh, preparing, actually, the uh, copyright reform, which then, uh, you know, materialized into a, a proposal of, uh, of the Commission in 2016 and led eventually to, to the adoption of, uh, of the new copyright directive in 2019. Uh, but eventually, this is a topic which uh, uh, we didn't uh, uh, add, let's say, to the uh, new copyright directive uh, largely because of this judgment. So, in a way, uh, we, uh, we had the impression, and I still believe, uh, that uh, at least as a point of law, this judgment has already clarified uh, a lot, actually, of the situation for e-lending. Then another question, which I think is the question that I'm really happy to discuss today, is what are the practical actual implication of, uh, of this judgment? Uh, but uh, this is just uh, to say that uh, this used to be, you know, a very topical discussion and uh, after 2017 uh, has been uh, a bit less. So, you know, is it because of the judgment? Is it because things work very well? Uh, um, probably not, uh, but I don't know. Let's, I think that uh, this is an, an, interesting, uh, an interesting question for, uh, for all of you. Now, uh, obviously, we are uh, acutely aware of the fact that with the lockdown, uh, uh, these uh, discussions uh, are re-emerging. And I think this goes uh, more broadly into uh, everything which has to do uh, with um, how libraries can uh, reach out to their uh, patrons, to citizens, basically, at a distance. Uh, and uh, so, I think that this is a relevant moment to, uh, to go back basically to, to, to check how things are on, uh, on the landing. Uh, now, a second consideration that I wanted to make briefly, and Severino already mentioned it, uh, uh, this is a very interesting judgment, not only because of everything that uh, it says, uh, but because is, it has, in my opinion, at least, uh, a, a quasi-legislative uh, effect uh, in the sense that, uh, and it is quite exceptional, actually, for judgments of the Court of Justice, uh, to go so much into details. I mean, obviously, this is also the consequences of the fact that uh, it comes uh, as an answer of the Court of Justice to questions which were very smart uh, very smartly put by the Dutch court. So, you know, the, in the questions of the Dutch court, the, there was already, you know, quite a lot of details on, on, on how the, you know, the, the suggestions for the answers. But it is a very interesting judgment because uh, uh, I think until 2017, most of us, so to say, let's say copyright uh, specialists around uh, Europe uh, would have considered that the Rental and Lending Directive uh, did not apply actually to electronic lending. This was the reason why the discussion was so topical before, before this judgment. And, uh, and, and don't forget that the Rental Lending Directive, the first version is from 1992, basically. So this is, uh, I mean, the, I, I don't know you, but the first time that I really had access to the internet was in 1994, and it was a very primitive version of the internet. So probably in 1992, well, maybe some public libraries were using the internet, but uh, probably not for lending. So it is clear that the, the court has uh, taken the courage actually to do something extremely interesting, which is basically to retrofit a little bit the um, rental lending directive, which uh, at the time of adoption clearly didn't have uh, e lending in mind, so to say, as a target to apply it uh, in the light to technological advancement uh, to the situation of lending as it is uh, uh, today and, and the lending. So it's a very interesting judgment, uh, really, because uh, it, it goes very far, actually, in terms of, uh, you know, how much the court really uh, has, you know, developed, uh, really, as I said, in my opinion, a quasi-legislative intervention on that. 
Now, I think the question is, uh, uh, is the judgment applied on the ground? Uh, what is happening uh, today and, and so on? And, and, and to be honest, I don't have the answer. That's the reason why you know, I'm very happy to be at this uh, seminar. Uh, what I can tell you is that uh, uh, over the last years, uh, we, we, we didn't have much discussion, if at all, on that. So uh, it is very difficult for me to have a sense of what's happening you know, on the ground. I was listening to the intervention of Julia, but I came a little bit late, so I didn't catch it since the beginning. But I, I'm aware of the fact that there has been some discussion in Germany as to you know, a possible legislative reform at a national level, which has not happened yet, at least. Now, commission guidance, uh, well, it's something which, uh, you know, is uh, in theory always possible, uh, but it's also something that, uh, you know, we do when we have uh, really uh, concrete elements, uh, basically, to tell something to member states. So I think, uh, you know, I think that I'm conveying the sense that uh, until very recently, there was not much discussion on this matter. So, uh, you know, if I had to be very honest, no, I don't have the commission guidance on the landing in my drawer. But obviously, you know, uh, I, I'm here also to, to, to listen to everybody. And if the debate continues, you know, the, the, the commission will see, uh, will see whether there is any need for further clarification on this judgment. M maybe the judgment is already clear and is rather a question rather than guidance uh, of having uh, some kind of uh, sensibilization uh, and uh, raising awareness, basically, of member states and, uh, and public libraries uh, about the existence of, uh, of this framework. Uh, I don't know. I don't have the answer, actually, uh, but uh, as I said, I'm, I'm very happy to, to be here and to listen to, to everybody. Uh, the last point I want to make is departing a tiny bit from, uh, uh, from the judgment, but is, uh, is uh, to uh, somehow uh, highlight, as Sabrina said, that, that there are also other uh, avenues actually, uh, you know, uh, available to libraries uh, under European uh, uh, copyright law, uh, you know, when making available content uh, uh, to, uh, to, to, to citizens. Uh, and the two avenues that uh, Severin has mentioned are, are probably the two most relevant in addition actually to lending. Uh, one is the Orphan Work Directive, which uh, I know that uh, um, you know has not delivered uh, um, you know maybe the the effect that we hoped uh, so far, uh, and uh, the commission has uh, recently launched a study actually on the orphan works directive. So let's uh, let's uh, uh, let's see what what the result of this study are. And the other is something which is uh, uh, very new. It's uh, it's uh, it's a new mechanism actually for the. Uh, making available uh, of uh, out of commerce works, which is uh, partly based uh, on uh, simplified licensing agreement, extended collective licenses for the expert, and uh, partly based on a fallback exception, which has been introduced by the new directive, and it is currently being implemented by member states. So again, early to say how things will develop, but I think that, uh, and this is my conclusion for now, if I think about uh, all these different mechanisms in European law, uh, you know, which we have uh, largely introduced in the last years, uh, or that the Court of Justice has introduced in the last years uh, to, to facilitate uh, uh, the uh, libraries and to support their important role in society, on which I think you know, we fully agree with what the Court has said, uh, need to be understood and uh, need to be applied in practice by the libraries now. So my my take, uh, at least from uh, where I sit, uh, so the, the, the European Commission is that uh, probably, you know, what we need to do all together more uh, in the immediate future is uh, really getting more to the application of these things on the ground, to uh, speak more, I mean, uh, with, uh, uh, with the cultural heritage institutions, uh, and uh, you know to raise awareness uh, to facilitate their work uh, and this uh, in my opinion uh, uh, also considering uh, how difficult it is uh, to discuss copyright law uh, in uh, the european public sphere uh, uh, as the experience of the last year has shown uh, this uh, you know awareness raising uh, practical application uh, is likely to give uh, more result than not uh, embarking into 
rather abstract, uh, you know, legal discussion uh, or, or even, you know, legislative processes which uh, uh, are very complicated basically to sustain. So I think that uh, my final word is a recommendation to the Commission actually to keep talking uh, with the libraries, uh, raising awareness and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and trying, you know, to understand uh, at a practical level actually what is happening on the ground. Thanks a lot, Marco. Uh, that's very interesting. We'll, we already have one question, but uh, I'll ask afterwards as well to Julia and Severin uh, if you want to, to react to, to Marco. Julia, I think one of the questions that uh, is in the chat, the chat is addressed to you, saying that the case that we have been all mentioning talks about ebooks acquired by libraries and not scanned copies of ebooks, uh, of books, mm -hmm. which is what CVL is about. So if you want to address that, yeah. Yes. Um, so the case distinguishes between copies that are obtained legally, in which case uh, the e-lending is uh, covered by the exception for public lending, and uh, copies that were obtained from an illegal source. So, of course, purchasing a book is one way of uh, uh, obtaining a copy legally, but uh, making a copy of a work or a digitization under a copyright exception is also a, a legal way of obtaining a copy. So the court ruling says if the copy was obtained from an illegal source, then the uh, e-lending exception does not apply. But any legal source uh, would fall within um, this court ruling. Thanks a lot for the clarification. I see that there's another comment uh, insisting on the fact that uh, if we have an exemption uh, which is not enforceable at the end, uh, it risks ending the judgment. It's a little bit what Julia has said, Severine as well, and uh, a bit uh, a response to you, Marco, who is uh, talking about uh, not uh, doing uh, anything from the Commission side apart from, from raising awareness and, uh, and just to let you know that there are a few people saying that there's more uh, clarification to be done. I don't know if there's any questions from the U.S. colleagues of Severin. I see that you want to respond yet. So uh, I'll just give you the floor in, one, in 30 sorry. seconds. Just if anyone from the U.S. would like to ask a question to, to our three speakers, just uh, raise your hand or draft something in the chat. In the meantime, go ahead, Severin. No, I just wanted to react on that because it's true that, and, and, and what Marco said was really accurate. If we, if we want now to help uh, digital uh, libraries to, to, to engage in digital lending, we would need also to solve the issues of the, of the item, you know, because it's true what Julia said, that you can digital lend uh, a book that you have acquired, but most of the time what libraries want to do is to acquire an ebook and then lend the ebook and save the burden of, of digitizing uh, uh, tangible books. But the problem is that, of course, we know that digital lending is happening everywhere in the world, um, and it, it's happening based on licensing practices, on big platforms that that, that are acting as lenders from publishers and it will be very complicated and it, it answers the question of making the lending exception enforceable uh, where there are contracts in place because there are contractual relationship in place for e-lending right now so how do you shift from that license-based environment towards an exception-based environment is this the right thing to do uh, if, if, if we do that uh, or is it better to keep the license that we have and maybe try to correct them to make them more equal for all libraries? And, you know, because, for instance, the one copy, one user model has been gradually replaced in many countries by a model where you are, the libraries is allowed a number of, of loads or a number of, of, uh, of loans or a number or a time limit. Afterwards, it has to pay again. So it disadvantaged smaller libraries that might have have paid for an ebook with a possibility to lend it uh, 12 times, but actually because it's a small library, it will pay a huge amount of money and it has been checked out only two times, you know? So how do you, how do you counter those licensing practices that might be unbalanced? And this is a question I could ask to the librarians who are there today to say whether they th what they think about the licensing conditions that are right now applicable, whether in the US or the EU, because I don't see a future in the exception quite soon. 
Yeah, very interesting remark. I don't know if anyone wants to, to take the floor to, to react to this, any of the librarians uh, from the US or, uh, or yeah. Could, could I just add, uh, throw something out here? And that is yeah, that- um, Go ahead. Um, if people are gonna defend uh, licensing and contracts is, is, is the best way to move forward, I think they have to address the issue of what do you do when the contracts are not reasonable? It was discussed earlier, the idea that you, 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 you want to be able to deal with the reasonableness of contracts. But if that's sort of a mythical unicorn in terms of an intervention, then I, I think it's disingenuous. I think if, you, if, if you're going to talk about contracts, you have to talk uh, that are in the private sector, you have to talk about what are the mechanisms, if any, outside of exceptions to rights exist to do with unfair contracts. Uh, this is Dave here, um, uh, American librarian. <laughs> um, so yeah, one, one of the things I just wanted to address there about that licensing issue is, um, uh, number one, um, from our perspective, and I'm just speaking for my institution's library, but I, I know this is true for some others too. Uh, if we can license an ebook under reasonable terms, um, we will do that 10 times out of 10 rather than scan a book and try to provide a scanned um, CDL copy. Uh, and that's for a lot of reasons. One is, um, you know, if I can buy an EPUB copy, uh, it's more accessible um, and uh, it's easier to manage in our systems. Um, and so that's something that we actively look for. Uh, but Jamie has a really good point that the licensing terms matter a lot. And, um, you know, one of the shifts that we've seen uh, in the digital environment is a movement from basically allowing the default rules of copyright to govern how we interact with creative works to allowing private contracts to dictate those terms. And those private contracts can often have really problematic, uh, long lasting terms built into them. And from the library standpoint, you know, we're buying materials for our users to get access to today, but we're also buying those materials because we want people to have access to them a hundred years in the future. And it becomes deeply problematic if we've got contract terms that are of unlimited duration that govern our use. I mean, have any of you tried to like really parse hundred year old contracts and figure out how they apply to your day to day business activities today? Uh, we have some of those things and it's almost impossible. And so, you know, if we're trying to extend and build, build a collection that um, is useful over a very long period of time, um, binding terms of use uh, and, and, and uh, licensing provisions can be really problematic. I mean, we have challenges just reaching back to the uh, late 1980s and 90s with contract terms that don't make any sense today uh, that talk about things like, you know, how many CD-ROMs we can put uh, together for a particular type of material. Uh, so, so that's where I think it's really important that um, we not allow um, licensing to subsume uh, what is otherwise this, uh, this delicate balance that um, the legislatures have struck between rights of authors and uh, rights of, of rights holders and um, users in the Copyright Act. Thanks a lot, David, for, I mean, I'm seeing that there's a lot of activity, um, a lot of activity uh, in the chat. I'm really sorry, but I'll have to cut here. Uh, it shows that the topic is interesting and that we should follow up with uh, maybe another event to continue this discussion. Uh, I'm really sorry, but we have a, a third panel on the international perspective and we, we, we need to, to move there. So thanks a lot for the three speakers and for all the people who asked the questions. Uh, I hope you can, uh, we can meet soon. And uh, I'll pass now the floor to, to Teresa uh, to, to continue the, the, the event. Okay, that's thanks great. Uh, thank you very much, Federico, and thanks to all the speakers for a really, um, really informative and uh, interesting discussion. So, for, um, so we're going to move now on to the final panel, um, which is looking at the international perspective. Um, my name is Teresa Hackett. I work for an NGO called Electronic Information for Libraries that works with libraries in developing and transition economy countries. Um, I manage the program on copyright and libraries. Um, and for the uh, looking at the international perspective, I mean, as, as, as Manon said at the start of the seminar, um, the, the pandemic is global. Um, and at the end of March, 
there were an estimated 1.5 billion learners in 193 countries affected by the closure of schools and educational institutions. And as was also mentioned, these changes happened overnight and midway through the, the academic year. So for education conti to continue, it had to move off campus and online. And these significant disruptions, which we which we witnessed all around the world, will continue for, for some time to come. So this truly is uh, an international um, issue. So we have two, uh, two great speakers who will offer some, some brief, uh, brief remarks. And I'll first of all introduce our first speaker, who is um, Stephen Viber. Uh, Stephen is the Manager for Policy and Advocacy at IFLAT, the International Federation of Library Associations and Institutions. Um, before joining IFLA, uh, Stephen worked at the British Embassy in Paris and was on the UK permanent delegation at the OECD, the uh, Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. And Stephen is going to talk, talk to us about the international state of play regarding um, CDL and the practice of libraries in different countries around the world. So Stephen, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Theresa, and, and thank you to, to KEI for the invitation. I wanted to start by just echoing a point made by Severine Dussolier earlier that um, this is clearly a, a big issue for libraries going forward. Um, we are moving to a different balance of content between the physical and the digital. Up to now, libraries have tended to use a disproportionate share of their acquisitions budget for electronic content, so a large share of the budget for a relatively small share of content offered. Um, and there is a real fear now that as this shifts, I know libraries are likely to continue offering a mixed service going ahead but with lower physical and more digital and there's a big question about does this risk emptying out those budgets quickly without any net gain to rights holders at all because it's still the same amount of money being used and um, so getting on to the subject I'm, I'm supposed to be talking about and um, first of all clearly there has been a strong interest in cdl from around the world so I was looking around at which lib guides and which libraries are actually talking about it and encouraging their students to take a look. And there are examples from Uruguay, from Belgium, France, Haiti, Poland, Italy, the UK and beyond. So first of all, this is clearly something that's been picked up on as a, a useful resource for the people. Um, there have been some more advanced examples, libraries that have actually given content, have shared their content with uh, Internet Archive with the Open Library in order to be able to support access. Now, the most prominent example, I think, is Canada. It's been mentioned very much that this is not just an American project, it's an American-Canadian project. So we have a couple of libraries in particular, the University of Alberta and the Hamilton Public Libraries, which have looked to actually make their content available. Now, They've gone through this. There's a re really interesting legal opinion from Hamilton uh, County Public Libraries in Canada, which sets out the reasons why they think that even under Canadian law, so even in the absence of that quite broad, flexible fair use provision and rather a uh, rather fair dealing provision, you can still make this work. And they argue that and as long as you have that, uh, except well, as long as you have the exhaustion principle, as long as you have a sentiment of technological neutrality, that you should treat technologies neutrally, and as long as you have a strong protection of the research exception, then this is all possible. What's interesting here, and, and this applies both in the case of the public library and the university library, is that the focus is very much on out of commerce works or old copyright materials, as, as the Hamilton legal opinion suggests. Um, the other example given, and this is actually already covered in a blog produced by the Internet Archive, is the National Library of Aruba. And in the case of Aruba, in exactly what Teresa described was happening, schools, universities had to shut very quickly. And in particular, this is a country that's trying to move away from its colonial heritage, that really is trying to produce and share more works in Pavimento, more works talking about what happens in the, in the Caribbean rather than clogs and windmills. And they found that actually being able to share their material with the internet, with, with the internet archive, give access through there really helped. They, of course, talked to the local authors, made sure that everything was working okay. And so in fact, CDL provided a really helpful infrastructure for them 
to actually be able to give access and to continue to support education and learning on the island. Um, beyond these two examples, I think there's quite a lot of wait and see going on. I think a lot of people are, are watching and waiting what's going on with, with the legal case and we'll be interested to see what comes out. I think Yulia made a very good point about people wanting a degree of legal certainty. Um, but clearly there are other countries where arguably the protection of that research education exception, exhaustion and technological neutrality could also play. So I think we could see some interesting, there is the potential for it to spread. Um, we are also, one of the factors that is likely to drive this is some of the challenges we're seeing at the moment around the challenges in terms for electronic content. In particular with the crisis, it is likely to become very clear quite how much you get for your digital dollar compared to your physical dollar, quite how many e-loans, e uh, how many times you can lend an e-book for a certain amount of money compared to how many times you can lend a physical book for that amount of money. We're already seeing in the UK some concern about rapid price rises or the lack of availability of e-books to libraries efforts to either encourage libraries to buy whole bundles of ebooks or to encourage students themselves to buy their own copies. Um, this happens in the UK. It also seems to be a problem in Denmark. We're seeing it in Singapore as well. So we are seeing this really flash up in different parts of the world. One of the suggestions that does come up again in different parts of the world is to what extent that possibility that is covered by controlled digital lending to lend a digitized copy of a physical book can actually help correct this, can actually introduce a useful bit of competition. And in fact, this is more of a European example than an international one. Arguably, this is one of the reasons behind the veil based in Leinrecht discussion was to provide a sort of idiot guard, a sort of backstop, which would mean that license terms, that there is a backstop, but when license terms become too crazy, libraries do have the option just to go back and lend lend a digital lend a copy themselves obviously the best solution is when we can come to much more um when you can come to one copy multiple user agreements and of course these need to be done in agreement with publishers and we welcome anything that really brings everyone to the table this will help elsewhere um more broadly i think as already we've mentioned what's this is again a European thing, the potential that out of commerce works, the legislation there brings in. This is interesting given that clearly this is what Canadian libraries at the moment have been focusing on. Um, clearly what will have, a lot will depend on the implementation of the out of commerce works provisions. Certainly the proposals so far for the portal uh, have been quite disappointing. They seem to mirror very much what's happened with the Orphan Works Directive, which could really actually limit the potential of the rules in the digital single market directive to actually make this helpful. Um, I think that broadly covers it. I, I should say, um, of course, I know through all this, and this comes back to the point earlier about the end goal of what we're doing is to ensure that there is access. Um, and of course, I know there's a lot of welcome for the measures that have been taken by publishers in order to allow this. The deals that have been done in Ireland, in Australia, in New Zealand to allow for story times, the move by the Czech um, collective management organization to allow much wider access to materials held by the National Library. I think the challenge is that we're talking about something that shouldn't purely depend on goodwill, that we need everyone to benefit from this automatically rather than having to just benefit and hope to chance that everyone's having a good day and that we can make things work that way. So I think, yes, we're very much looking forward to, hopefully, I think the library is a positive outcome from the court case in the US at the moment. But I think, as Julia said, that legal certainty will really help. Okay, Stephen, thank you very much indeed. Um, so our next and uh, second and in speaker in this panel and our final speaker of the day, last but not least, um, is uh, Luis Villaroyal. Um, Luis is the director of uh, NGO Enivarte. He's a lawyer and the former uh, vice chair of WIPO's Committee on Copyright and Related Rights, which is the body that sets global copyright, copyright norms. And in 2004, while representing Chile um, in WIPO, he introduced the exceptions agenda at the WIPO SCCR committee, proposing a treaty for the benefit of libraries, archives, 
um, education and disabilities. He's also worked on a number of copyright reforms in Latin America, including Chile and in Ecuador, and he represented Ecuador in negotiations at the Marrakesh Treaty um, in, uh, in during those that stages of the negotiations. So Luis is going to talk about how CDL is being addressed in a Latin American country and what are the legal challenges. So uh, Luis, the floor is yours and um, I'm going to uh, set my set my stopwatch here and uh, give you a, a signal at five minutes as you asked me to do. So thank you. thank you. Thank you very much. Well, thank you to Teresa. Thank you to KI for inviting and thank you to all those who are still staying on online uh, as I realize that it's very late for many of you. Uh, well, the, the good thing of being the last is that I, I can draw some uh, conclusions on to draw some uh, uh, ideas from what everybody has said. And, and, and the first thing is that we have a, a common justification uh, for clearly for uh, control digital lending. Uh, the justification might uh, change a little bit uh, in the case of developing countries. We, we have the example of Chile where we, we, don't, we don't have only the issue of the 20th century gap, but we also have the issue that many digital uh, books, e-books that are available in other regions of the world are not available for Chile, which is something very shocking as a, a model of uh, marketing of, from some publishers. Uh, the, the other in, important thing is that we, we have to, to see that in addition that we have uh, some common uh, needs, th there are a lot of difference be between the legal framework where this uh, controlled digital lending take place. So we, we will we'll find that in, uh, for example, in in Latin American countries, uh, like in the case of Chile, we don't have a lending right for the author, and therefore we don't have an exception for lending uh, for libraries. So, so that clear uh, creates an, an additional, you know, difference from what you have been discussing. But we don't have a fair use provision. So, therefore, uh, when we we are thinking on uh, addressing uh, 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 the CDL, is that Although we won't have a problem with the lending, we will have a problem with the reproduction and the making available of the copy. Uh, so, so we will need a, a express a exception for doing a, a, a controlled digital lending in general. A, luckily, some of our law, like in the case of Chile and Ecuador, a, despite we don't have a specific provision for controlled digital lending, we do have some provision that might offer some uh, protection for doing something uh, like a uh, controlled digital lending. And if I am allowed to, to share my, my screen, I might show you more clearly what I'm talking about. Good. Am I sharing my screen? Oh. Uh, no. Uh, oh, that. Okay, I, I got the message. Well, uh, so so what is the situation, uh, for example, in Chile? In, in Chile, we have a special provision, and also that is available in Ecuador, that uh, libraries might digitize all their collections and make it available to terminals not limited to uh, Not, not limited to a, a terminal within the library, but it can be used in any terminal that is related to the uh, institution. So uh, professors and, 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 and university students might access to the works online at their, in, their, their, in their, their cell phones in, uh, at home. So that, that is a, a, something like a controlled digital lending because they, they cannot download and they cannot make a copy. Unfortunately, that do not apply for a general library uh, to, to uh, lend to anyone uh, any type of books. So it's not enough. So, so, so the question is, uh, what are the uh, legal challenges from the international perspective? Uh, so what are the flexibilities for providing a digital lending uh, 
uh, control digital lending uh, possibility for, for libraries and, uh, and archives, for example. Well, we, we have to, we have a positive note that under TRIPS, we don't have a lending or distribution on making available rights. And also in Bern Convention, those rights do not exist for the author. So uh, the, the, there will not be an, an issue for making a, a copy for making available online. Uh, also, it's important to remember that, that TRIPS do not uh, provide any limitation to countries on how they define the issue of exhaustion. So if we are in, in a only trip uh, world, I would say that it's not, not really a, a problem to provide a controlled digital lending. Nonetheless, we most of the countries now have uh, been subject to the standards of the WIPO copyright treaties, where making available right is, is present and also the a broad communication to the public. In this context, uh, my view is that it still won't, won't be a problem to, to have a specific uh, exception for controlled digital lending, having in mind that, that the, uh, in Article 10 of the WIPO Copyright Treaty, th there is an agreed statement that explicitly says that uh, the three-step test uh, there do, do, do not preclude countries for uh, extending the, their exceptions to the digital environment. So it shouldn't be a, a, a problem, a, a serious problem, the WIPO copyright treaty to provide the specific exception. Also uh, uh, going uh, beyond to other type of uh, flexibilities, we, we, if, if we see it from the point of view of TRIPS, uh, we can all also, in addition to what will be the three-step test, we, we can uh, rely on Article 44.2 of TRIPS and also on Article 73. 73. Article 44.2, for those who are not lawyers, uh, provides that the, a, a country might uh, limit the remedies against an infringement of, of copyright. In this case, if we, we were considered an, an infringement of copyright uh, control digital lending, we, they can, the country might limit their uh, remedy to the payment of a adequate compensation. Also in Article 73, uh, there is a specific uh, security exception. And Article 73 says that nothing disagreement shall be construed to prevent a member from taking an, any action which considers necessary for the protection of its essential security interest. Therefore, considering the, the pandemic element that uh, we, we are facing today, we, we might also consider that a country might uh, avail themselves on this provision to provide a specific exception for controlled digital lending. So uh, 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 finalizing my intervention, we, we have to, to see some strate strategic uh, option that we have. First, whether we are going to, to address the issue of, of digital control digital lending as an issue uh, for the pandemic. I mean, are we going to, to, to to put all, all our energy to, to have a short and, and fast solution considering the pandemic, or we want to address it for all times. Clearly, if we are going to ad address uh, thinking on the emergency, that, that will be uh, much, much easier as we, we see that there are consideration that go beyond copyright that are uh, much more important. And, and if we go there, we, we could think on a WIPO or, or or, or, or TRIPS or WHO fast track declaration, uh, you know, clarif clarifying the need of and, and the permissivity or, or the possibility of doing a uh, control digital lending as a way to uh, prevent uh, further uh, uh, issues related to the to, to the uh, the pandemic. But if we want to to go in in a in a more uh, uh, I would say m more permanent uh, solution. We, we we should think on 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 including this specifically on the the treaty proposed for exception and limitation for libraries, archives, and museums that we are working in WIPO, basing our uh, request on Article 10 WCT 
uh, and, uh, and the agree statement, and also uh, relying on Article 44.2 of TRIPS. And uh, I will stop here. Uh, I, I didn't see you, Teresa, if you stopped me, but... Uh, oh, I did. I was waving, I was waving my phone furiously. Oh, well, <laughs> I, 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 I didn't have the... the... <laughs> oh, sorry, I, I was no, looking no, at my PowerPoint. That's... That's good. You're good. Thank you very much, uh, Luis. And I think that was a, a really, a really nice summary um, to summarise up the international situation and um, and what is the the, the legal framework um, underpinning this uh, this issue. So, um, so many thanks to to you both. Um, if there are any questions um, for either Stephen or Luis on this panel, um, please raise your hand or, or, or put them into the chat. Or if not, um, I suggest that we, we go back to, we hand back to our, um, our moderators and we, we wrap up for a general discussion. So you can raise all, feel free to raise other issues um, in the general discussion as well. I know there was a good chat going on um, on, on licensing issues there. Um, and uh, Jamie has put some information into the chat on the trips. And Luis, um, that slide that you weren't able to share with us, if you want to send that to me, we can, we can share that with all the participants as well. Okay, Thanks. I will, thank you. So, so I think I'm handing back um, to, to Jamie and Augustine, is that right? Our co-chairs? Yeah, I, I, I think that's fine. It's, um... We're, we're right at the, uh, we're, we're sort of like five minutes and we're supposed to be finished, I think. So uh, I think it's, it's, everything has gone pretty, pretty close uh, to, to the time. I, I, I it, this is one of those cases where we had a large number of really um, knowledgeable and interesting speakers. And uh, uh, it's not, we're not really, I think, as Augustine has mentioned before, is we're not really in a position to really resolve everything. I, I just want to mention to the representative from the Authors Guild, I, I'm actually, a I think I still have a membership in the Authors Guild. And it may be that uh, uh, there, there should be some future collaborations on some of these issues of, of fair and unfair contracts. Because I think you know, representing authors, sometimes the contracts that the authors sign don't reflect uh, what you may think is uh, an appropriate regime in some areas. And I, I'm, I'm sympathetic to your idea that uh, authors should be paid, although I don't think I've ever gotten any money from the Authors Guild for my own contributions uh, in the United States, only only from a, a, a British collection society, which sends me money from time to time through you. I just, just wanted to say we do actually, the Authors Guild has an authors registry and, the, and we collect licensing revenues for US authors from the mandatory collective licensing regimes that exist in Europe, and we do. I, I I forget the figure, but it's a quite 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 a large figure. And you know, if two individual authors, it might be you know five hundred dollars a year. But you you know five hundred dollars that you were not expecting was coming. So so I, I I do think that there are a lot of nuances and and uh, um, you know to, to to figure out how we can keep this market for for the secondary market for authors viable while also you know having the access that we should have. Uh, is, is Augustine, is he still on right now? Because I know- Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm here, I'm here. No, just, just to say, it was a really a fascinating um, discussion. It was really great to have you uh, also so engaged. Um, and I think that as um, uh, Marco said, uh, this, is, this topic is not discussed enough. And I think it's uh, very important that uh, as TACD, we come together, we bring all these very smart people to share so generously their, um, their, their knowledge, because at the end of the day, yes, uh, readers are, are, are consumers, are researchers, are, are students. So, um, so we have also responsibility to discuss uh, all, these, uh, all these issues with us. Um, we took note that, of course, you know, um, the publisher expressed uh, interest to continue this discussion, and, and certainly we will um, keep them uh, on board. I think the, the, we, um, we need to bring everybody that is concerned on this topic around the table. So just very briefly to say, again, thank you very much, all of you. A special thanks you know, to Jamie and Manon, who actually was the one who brought this, this topic to the attention of, of TACD. So I'm extremely happy that we were able to have such an excellent, excellent discussion with all of you. Um, so well, I can only thank you again and, and, and wish you a, a very good uh, evening to my European <laughs> colleagues and friends and a very good day to the rest of you <laughs> in, in the US. Thank you very much.
<laughs> yeah, um, <clears throat> yeah, I would just echo everything you said. And, and, and I like a really a place that the Authors Guild was able to join us because we were, we did want to have like different points of view. I will also mention that a lot of the TACD members themselves uh, uh, historically have received a lot of their money from public publishing. Uh, the, uh, 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 so the copyright issue has always had, uh, with the, a lot of the consumer groups sell, you know, historically they used to sell magazines and that used to be the major source of revenue for them. Um, anyway, uh, I think we'll wind up right now. Is Mano, is, I think Mano had to leave or is, is Mano here? I'm yeah. here. I'm here, but I, I think you've seen enough of me. I, I, I'm, just, I'm just hoping that uh, we can uh, we can have a, another meeting because one of the issue was to to uh, have more information and more data uh, for the TACD to actually uh, draft a resolution of some sort or a statement of some sort related to uh, e-lending or CDL in times of pandemic. I would really thank all the speakers who've been very patient and uh, who've been very uh, informative. I also would like to make sure everybody checks out David Hansen's room because Room Raider would say he's 10-10. Look at that. He even has a balance <laughs> of justice. <laughs> this is really the nice touch. And uh, nobody had the hostage room, so everything went fine and I thank you all and I'm going to be off and walking my dogs now. Thank you. <laughs>